let's work through some basic problems about approximating and understanding the definite integral in calculus, and then at the end we'll do a harder problem about a limit of Riemann sums. Number one, consider the table of values of a function f of x that you see right here. Part A says, does the function f appear to be increasing or decreasing? Let's go ahead and do that first. It might be helpful to graph it. It is important to realize it's an appearance. What does it look like is the case. It's not a definitive answer because we only have a finite set of data points for the function f. So let's go ahead and graph what we see. x on the horizontal axis, y on the vertical axis. When x is 0, f of x is 300. Let's pretend this is 300 right there. When x is 10, f of x is 370. Let's put 400 right here. 370 would be right about here or so. When x is 20, f of x is 420. We go above 400. When x is 30, f of x is 450, maybe right about there or so. And when x is 40, we're up at 460, just a little bit higher at x equals 40, okay? So the function has these data points. It looks like it's increasing. It appears to be increasing. However, again, that is just an appearance. Looks could be deceiving. The function could be oscillating in between these data points. You'd have to know by the application whether it's really an increasing function or not. Part B says, assuming your answer to part A is correct, that it really is an increasing function, use the table to estimate this integral, specifically to get a lower or underestimate and an upper or overestimate, as well as an average of the two estimates, okay? So what are we trying to do here? We're trying to approximate a definite integral, which when the graph is above the axis, as this appears to be, will be the area under the curve. Let's go ahead and draw a plausible curve here. We don't know exactly what the function looks like in between these points, but it's reasonable to assume in most situations where the function is not behaving wildly, that it's gonna look about like this and we are trying to approximate the area under this curve, the area of this region right here. When you do a lower estimate in the most basic kind of setup for definite integrals, you are using rectangles to approximate the area under the curve, and when it's an increasing curve like this, you would use what's called a left-hand sum for each one of these subintervals, in this case, 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and 30 to 40, for the overall in uh, interval from 0 to 40, we use the left endpoint to go up to the function and mark off a horizontal line that's gonna be the top of an approximating rectangle. That's a mouthful for something that's actually kind of a fairly basic idea. And we're gonna do that for each one of these subintervals. For this one, go from 10 to 20, choose the left endpoint 10, go up to the curve, make a line, and that's gonna be the top of an approximating rectangle. Do it for the other ones as well. And that is approximating the area under the curve, the sum of the areas of these four rectangles, this one is supposed to go up here, is supposed to approximate the area under the curve, and because it's below the curve, it's gonna be a lower estimate. It's gonna be under the true value of the area under the curve. It's under the true value of the integral. The integral is the exact area under the curve. We are trying to approximate that. And we have to approximate it here because we don't know a formula for f of x. If you know about the fundamental theorem of calculus, we can't use that yet. We only have data points and we are assuming the function is well behaved. It does look like it's increasing. So let's go ahead and do it now. How do you do that? Well, you could just write down a sum giving you the areas of these rect rectangles. The uh, base for each rectangle is 10 and the height varies. The height of the first rectangle is 300. Base times height is 10 times 300. For the next rectangle, base times height is 10 times, well, what's the height here? You gotta go to the table. 370 is the height of this second rectangle. That's 370 there. 10 times 370 plus each rectangle again has a base of 10. The height of this next one is the 420. And then base times height for the last rectangle is 10 times the height is 450. Of course, you could factor out a 10 out of all that before adding. Uh, you also can just go ahead and multiply each of these. 3,000 plus 3,700 plus 4,200 plus 4,500. Dare I do it in my head? That's going to give 6,700. 
Oh, that'll give up to 10,900 and then another 4,500 will be to 15,400. I think I did that right. I better double check. I never want to feel too confident that I did it right here. So I'll double check that. Certainly the first two is 6,700 plus 4,200 plus 4,500. Yes, I did it right. 15,400 is the answer for this lower estimate. Okay. It's too low for the value of the integral. That's going to be a lower estimate. You could also again call it an underestimate. What about an overestimate? Instead of using the left endpoint of each interval to determine the heights of the rectangles, use the right endpoint of each interval. That's another systematic way of approaching this. There are other ways of approaching it that are even better. So for the first interval from 0 to 10, the right endpoint is 10. Go up to the curve, mark off a line right there with a height of 370 for this rectangle. That'll shade in black now. And then do that for each interval for the zero, 10 to 20. The right end point is 20. Go up to the curve, mark off the top of your rectangle. I'll go ahead and shade it this time black. From 20 to 30, you go to the right end point. Get a rectangle about like this. And from four, 30 to 40, go up to the curve and get a rectangle about like this. And the areas of those rectangles um, are going to match, for the first three of them, are going to match what we did here. You're going to get 10 times 370 plus 10 times 420 plus 10 times 450, right? Because this first black rectangle is really the same as this red rectangle that's over here, shifted to the left by 10 units. The base for all these rectangles is the same. Could you use different bases? You could, but we're not. And then the last rectangle here has got a height of 460, so we really have a 10 times 460. So we're going to get 3,700 plus 4,200 plus 4,500 plus 4,600. Uh, you could do a quick calculation. The fact that 4,600 is 1,600 more than 3,000 is going to mean the final answer is 1,600 more. We should get 17,000 here. Let's double check it. 3,700 plus 4,200 uh, is... 7,900, the sum of those two is 9,100, yeah, 17,000, that's our upper estimate or overestimate. Again, it's guaranteed to be, this one's guaranteed to be a lower estimate and this one an upper estimate if the function truly is increasing. By the way, if the function is decreasing, the left and right hand sums, as we could also call these, switch around which one is the lower estimate and which one is the upper estimate. You should think about that. And then we want to average the two to get what should be a better estimate. Average the two to get a better estimate. We should also in part B here, look, it says what values of n and delta x did you use? I haven't mentioned what n and delta x are. I'll have to do that. So the average of the two, average of the lower plus the upper, or the lower and the upper, is the lower plus the upper divided by 2. 15,400 plus 17,000 divided by 2 is going to be halfway between them. There's a distance of uh, 1,600 between them, so halfway between them would be 15,400 plus 800 would be 16,200. This actually has a name. It's called a trapezoid estimate, and I'll explain why in a minute here trapezoid estimate. Uh, the way we found this one based on left endpoints makes this also called a left en left hand estimate or a left hand sum. The way we found this one using right endpoints means this is also called a right hand estimate or a right hand sum. Again, it happens to be the case that since the function is increasing, the left hand sum is a lower and the right hand sum is an upper. But again, if the function were decreasing, it would switch around. If the function goes both up and down, then it's not going to be clear which one is going to be an upper estimate and which one is going to be a lower estimate. Trapezoid estimate is the average of the two. Uh, before explaining why it's called the trapezoid estimate, let's go ahead and answer the question, what values of n and delta x did you use? This is standard notation for, first of all, n is the number of subintervals, which is the same as the number of rectangles in either, either case. So n is 4. We used for both the left-hand sum and the right-hand sum, we used four rectangles. 
That's the value of n. And delta x is the base of each of these rectangles, or the width of each subinterval, which is 10. Delta x change in x is 10 in each case. That is going to be each of these numbers that we use in both sums. And it is actually common to write these sums with summation notation and actually put the delta x on the right and the function values on the left. Um, I did this in my last video. You could write this in summation notation with a capital sigma. Sigma notation, it's also called. Function values f of xi, say, times delta x. Function values at x1, then x2, then x3, then x4. Or maybe, starting even at x0, we have the left endpoint here being 0. That's labeled x sub 0. This is x sub 1. This is x sub 2. This is x sub 3. And this is x sub 4. For the left-hand sum, we start i at 0. f gets evaluated at x sub 0, the left endpoint of the first interval 0. To determine the height of the rectangle, it was 300. It was this red line right there was the top of the rectangle. Those are function values. Those are heights of rectangles. And each delta x is a width of a rectangle. And we go up, and we the last value of i we use is 3, because we the uh, last interval we plugged in x3 was 30 into the function to determine the height of this rectangle for that sum. So that's the sum for the left-hand sum. And for the right-hand sum, uh, this ends up being a very similar kind of sum, except let i go from 1 to 4 instead of 0 to 3. i goes from 1 to 4, f of xi times delta x. And both the left and right hand sums are called Riemann sums. Now, why is this called the trapezoid estimate? Because in reality, when you average these two, you are really finding areas of trapezoids. You're really taking uh, the average of the, the areas of these two rectangles, the red and the black one, or the, the one that was had the top that was red and the one that's shaded black. By averaging them, you're really finding the area of this trapezoid here with this slanted top. Do that for each one of these rectangles. And this ends up equaling the sum of the areas of those trapezoids, being the average of the left and right hand sums. This is going to help us for part C. Part C says, does the function f appear to be concave up or concave down? Again, appearances could be deceiving. But what does it appear to be if it's well behaved? It appears to be concave down. For each time x increases by 10, the increase of f of x gets smaller and smaller. Here, f of x increases by 70, then 50, then 30, then 10. It's increasing at a lower and lower rate as x increases. It's concave down. The second derivative appears to be negative. And because of that, so that's the answer for D or C, concave down. It appears to be concave down, assuming it's well behaved. And because of that, that's going to help us with part D, where we answer the question, assuming the answer to C is correct, that it's concave down, is your average of the two estimates, the trapezoid estimate, a lower or an upper estimate? Based on how I drew it, the trapezoid that I drew, the trapezoids that I drew are underneath the curve because the curve's concave down. When you connect, when you make secant lines between points on a concave down graph, the secant lines will be beneath the curve. And so those areas will be too small. The answer will be, that it's a lower estimate. You could also call it an upper est uh, an underestimate. Lower estimate and underestimate are the same thing. If the graph were concave up, then the lines for the trapezoid, trapezoids that you use would be above the curve and the area would be too big and it would be an upper estimate instead of a lower estimate. In number two, we're more explicit about calling these estimates left hand and right hand Riemann sum sums in the directions here, with n equal to 4, to approximate this definite integral, the integral from 0 to 2 of e to the negative x squared dx. Now our function has a formula. So we should be able to use a calculator here to help us. Then average the two estimates to get a trapezoid estimate, just like before. All right, so part a. Well, let's go ahead and draw the graph anyway. We don't really need to draw the graph to see what's going on here. I won't bother graphing it on my calculator at the moment. Um, but if you do graph it on the calculator, over the entire real number line, the graph looks like a bell-shaped curve. You can check it out on your calculator. And we are most interested in the part of the curve that is to the right of the axis between 0 and 2. It turns out the inflection point of this curve is a little less than 1. So 2 ends up being right about here. So over the interval that we're interested in, 
the graph is above the axis, so the integral is going to be the area under the curve. We're trying to approximate that area. It is decreasing, so a left-hand sum using left-hand points to determine the heights of the rectangles will be too big, opposite of what happened in the first problem, and a right-hand sum will be too small. It's a mixture of concave down and concave up, so it's unclear whether a trapezoid estimate will be too big or too small. It could be either way. I will have the calculator approximated as well as possible so we can see what does happen. So that's the area we're trying to approximate. The left-hand sum, which I like to abbreviate LHS, just like before, is a summation of function values, f of x i times delta x, where i goes from 0 to, well, if n is 4, it goes to n minus 1, which will be 3, just like in the first problem. Uh, we're going to use four rectangles, n is 4. What are these xi's? a, the left end point of the interval of integration is 0, b is 2, n is 4. It turns out the formula for, well, uh, let's figure out delta x next. Delta x is always the length of the entire interval, which is b minus a, divided by n. So that's 2 minus 0 over 4 in this case, 1 half, or 0 0.5 if you prefer. And it turns out then that the endpoints of the subintervals will be 0.5 units apart, which means they'll have to be 0, 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, and 2. 0 will be x sub 0. 0.5 will be x1, 1 will be x2, 1.5 will be x3, and 2 will be x4. So to be more specific about what the summation is, it's going to be f of x0, which is f of 0, times delta x is 0.5, plus f of x1, which is 0.5, times 0.5, plus f of 1, that's x2, times 0.5, plus f of 1.5 times 0.5, and you stop there, you don't do f of 2 times 0.5. We want four approximating rectangles. We're ultimately going to be figuring out the sum of the, these areas, and I'm not drawing this perfectly, that look about like this. It's going to be an overestimate. Okay, so it's a matter now of plugging these things in the calculator. Remember, just like in number one, we'll be able to sell, save some work with the right-hand sums because we'll be able to reuse some of these numbers f of 0 is e to the 0 is 1. This is a 1. What's f of 0.5? The function is e to the negative x squared. So I'd have e to the negative 0.5 squared. It should do the 0.5 squared first and then use the negative sign. Let's just double check that. 0.5 squared is 0.25, so it's, this should be the same as e to the negative 0.25. Yep. Okay, so that's about 0.7788. How many decimal places should you use? It's not clear. It's not in the directions. I like to go overboard a little bit and use more than you probably need. Okay, I'll go ahead and use them all. We'll round at the end. If you round too soon, then the errors can build up, so it's good to be play it a little safe. f of 1 is e to the negative 1 squared. That'll be e to the negative 1. That is 0 0.36787944412. Yes, I'm going overboard here. I don't really need all those. 1.5 squared. 1.5 squared is 2.25. So e to the negative 2.25 is the next one. And that is about 0 0.10539922246. I'm just going to add those values up first and then multiply by 0.5. I mean, this notation is showing to multiply each by 0.5 first, but to save time, I'm just going to add up these values. So I'm going to go backwards. I got this number, then I'm going to add 0 0.36787944412 to give me this, and then I'll add the 0 0.77880078 to get this, and then add the 1. Don't forget to multiply by 0.5 times 0.5. gives approximately 1.126. Now I'll round. That seems reasonable to round to 1.126 if I've not made a mistake. Hopefully I've not. I'll make a note on the video if I did make a mistake. Right-hand sum. 
notationally with summation or capital sigma notation. It'd be very similar, except I would go from one to four. I'd use the exact same numbers here, except for the first one. And then I add on a last one for f of x4, which is f of two times 0.5. Let's go ahead and write it out. This is f of 0.5 times 0.5 plus f of one times 0.5 plus f of 1.5 times 0.5 and then plus f of two times 0.5. Now I would be adding areas of rectangles whose tops look like these right there. And it's definitely going to be an underestimate. Use the same numbers as before. One new number is f of 2. That'll be 2 squared is 4. So I'll get e to the negative 4, getting to be a pretty small number there, or pretty small height, 0.018315638 so now I'll add these other numbers here. Don't add the one and then multiply by 0.5. I guess I could, okay, I, I, let's just do it. I could save time by using that answer and going backwards, but let's just do, use all these decimals. So again, hang with me here. Add on this one, 399.22. Oh, I can't read my own writing. Is that a 96 or a 46? Ah. I am going to assume it's a 4, 6. And then add on the 0.36. We're going to round. It won't matter in the end. 9, 4, 4, 1, 2. And then add on the 0 0.7788007831. Then multiply by 0.5. About 0.635. And that's going to definitely be too low. Average the two to get the trapezoid estimate, which again, geometrically would represent areas of trapezoids, connect points on the curve with secant lines. The secant lines will be below the curve when it's concave down and above the curve when it's concave up. You can't really see that based on what I just drew there. Looks like it's gonna be pretty close to the curve and probably pretty close to the right answer. You could call the answer trap for short. LHS plus RHS divided by two and let's just use these rounded numbers and I won't worry about if I make a mistake, I'll, I'll round to one fewer decimal place, and that should help us play it safe here. 1.126 gets added to that, then divide by 2. About 0.88. Okay, it comes out nice. About 0.88 is the trapezoid estimate. All right. You could have more decimal places if you wanted to. All right, so that's the answer. Um, how does it compare with the true answer or the, a better approximation from the calculator? Let's graph it to find out plug in the function, e to the negative x squared. And again, it should do the squaring first before putting the negative sign in front. Window, 0 to 2 for the y, x, and y goes from, say, negative 0.1 to 1 just to see it. There's the graph. Yes, it turns out the inflection point's a little less than one. I think it's about, I think it might be one over root two if you want to check it on your own. There's what the graph looks like. Then calculate integrals number seven. Lower limit is zero. Upper limit of integration is two. Calculating that area and to a certain number of decimal places, that's the answer. And if you round that to two decimal places, wow, you do get 0.88. The trapezoid rule is doing pretty good. Number three is a quicker problem focused on the area interpretation of the integral. We've got this graph of a function that goes both above and below the axis. The area under the graph and it's above the axis is labeled to be seven. The area above the graph and below the axis when the graph is below the axis is labeled to be six. But if you know about integrals, you gotta be really careful here. Part A says, what is the value of the definite integral of this function from zero to three? Yes, the graph is above the axis. The integral is the area under the curve. The integral is seven. The definite integral of this function from zero to three does represent that area. That's the answer for part A. But part B is trickier. What is the value of the integral from three to five? Well, this, this is the first time you're learning this subject. You could be like, well, I don't know. Shouldn't, shouldn't it be this area six? The answer is no, it's not. When the graph goes below the axis, 
the area above the curve and under the axis contributes to the integral negatively. You might wonder why. I'll try to explain it here in a minute. So the answer is not 6, but negative 6. Okay? Why? I did introduce this actually in my last video, which was about introducing definite integrals via physics. That, for example, if x represents time, and you might prefer calling it t in that case, and this graph represents velocity, for example, where you are allowing motion in both directions, say to the right and to the left, right being the positive direction, left being the negative direction. If this is the velocity, when the velocity is positive, you're moving to the right, and when the velocity is negative, you're moving to the left, and you want the integral, here's the key, you want the integral to represent not the distance traveled in that case, but in fact the displacement, which is called a fancy word for change in position. You start here, you move to the right, then move to the left. What's your total change in position? That's what you want the integral to represent. And if you, the change in position could be negative, you could end up to the left of where you started, depending on the situation. And the area, the integral gives you the answer, the change in position, and it's always going to be the area of this one minus the area of that one. 7 minus 6 in this case for the entire interval of time from 0 to 5. From the interval of time from 3 to 5, you travel to the left. The velocity is negative, so the change in position is negative. The area is 6, but the integral is negative 6, and negative 6 would represent the change in position in that ca case. And we can combine it over the entire interval from 0 to 5. Part C is what is the value of the definite integral of f from 0 to 5? It is, like I hinted at, 7 minus 6 it'll be 1. If you want to be a little bit more official in the work you show for that, it's a property of integral, integrals that if you integrate over an interval like 0 to 5, you can break that up into an integral from 0 to 3 and an integral from 3 to 5. Add those two integrals. That's a property of integrals. Now I'm using 3 in this case as the intermediate point because we know that that's the value of 3 right there, we know this area, we know that area. But this fact is still true even if I replace the 3's in both spots with a 2 or a 2.7 or a 1.5 or a pi even. It still would be true, it's just not helpful in this case because we want to use this picture. That's a formal property of integrals. The value of this integral is 7, the value of this integral is negative 6. 7 plus negative 6 is the same as 7 minus 6 by definition of subtraction, which is 1. So the value of that integral is 1. Part D says, what is the value of the integral, not of f of x, but the absolute value of f of x, which is a new function. You could call it g of x, g of x being the absolute value of f of x. What's the graph of g look like? It's the same as the graph of f when the graph of f is above the axis. And when the graph of f is below the axis, it's the reflection of that piece of the graph across the x-axis. So the graph of g looks like this here, and then it bumps up like this over here. I don't know for sure if the distance to the x-axis of the peak here and the, the valley there is the same, but something about like this. And the area under that graph over here would be 6, and it would be an area under the graph because the graph's above the axis. It contributes positively to the integral. The integral of the absolute value would be 7 plus 6 is 13. And that actually represents the total distance traveled if the motion is both to the right and to the left. The integral of f of x itself, if it's, if it's a velocity, is the displacement, change in position. The integral of its absolute value is really the integral of its speed, speed being the absolute value of the velocity. And that's going to be the total distance traveled. If you go back and forth 7 units, then 6 units, you've traveled a total distance of 13 units. Here's the way to formally write your work. Once again, doing the same kind of thing. Break up the integral into pieces like this. The first piece, the absolute value of f of x is the same as f of x when f of x is positive, so this is 7. And here, the area under the curve is still 6, just like this area above the curve is 6, but as far as an integral goes, it contributes positively. This becomes positive 6 for a final answer of 13. In number four, we have a graphical problem where areas are not labeled, but they can be figured out. Notice that the x-axis is right here, and this graph that you see here for the function f of x is, well, 
partially piecewise linear, so we can think about areas of squares, rectangles, triangles, and that kind of thing, maybe trapezoids, and also over here. And it's also, well, nonlinear in here, but it looks like a special kind of nonlinearity. It should seem clear that that's a semicircle centered at the point 5 comma 0 with a radius of 2, and we know about areas of circles and semicircles and quarter circles. So that might be useful in doing these integrals. Yeah, that's what we want to use. Part A says evaluate the definite integral of f from 0 to 2. 2 is right here. That's 2. So it's this area minus this area. Let's just label the areas positively in the picture, but then ones where the graph is below the axis will contribute negatively to the integral. So this area right here is clearly 1. That's the area of the square, is what I'm talking about, 1 times 1. What's the area of this triangle here? 1 half times base, which is 1 half, times height, which is 1. That's 1 fourth. What's the area of this triangle? It's the same as the area of this other triangle by symmetry. As an area, it's still 1 half times base times height. Thinking of it as an actual height, even though it's below the axis, this is 1 fourth. So its area is 1 fourth, but it contributes negatively to the integral. Part A, the integral from 0 to 2 of f of x dx just represents this area minus this area. The sum of these two areas, by the way, is what I meant up here, minus this area. These two areas cancel each other out. 1 fourth minus 1 fourth is 0. We just get 1. That is the integral from 0 to 2. It's also the integral from 0 to 1. Part B, integral from 3 to 7. Here's 3, here's 7. It's going to be the area of this semicircle. That's going to be the answer. The integral from 3 to 7 of f of x. We don't need the formula for the function f of x. We, in this piece here, we could figure it out, but we don't have to. We just need to realize this is a semicircle. Area of an entire circle, right, is, is pi r squared. So the area of a semicircle is 1 half pi r squared. Yes, pi is involved here. The radius is 2. This is the radius there. So we get 1 half pi times 2 squared. 2 squared is 4 times 1 half is 2. Looks like this integral is 2 pi, which is approximately 6.28, but this is the exact representation of the answer. Part C, integral from 2 to 7. Okay, we know the integral from 3 to 7 by the same kind of property we used in the last problem. The integral from 2 to 7 is going to be the same as the sum of the integral from 2 to 3 plus the integral from 3 to 7. The integral from 3 to 7 is 2 pi. What's the integral from 2 to 3? This area right here is 1 half times 1 times 1, 1 half. It contributes negatively to the integral, so this becomes negative 1 half plus 2 pi. That is correct. That's the correct answer. If you'd like to write it as one fraction, you could get a common denominator of 2 and write it as 4 pi minus 1 all over 2. That would be yet another way to write that answer, but either way is okay. Part D, integral of f of x from 5 to 7.5. So the, this quarter circle here to 7.5. 7.5 is right there. Looks like we need the area of this triangle. Area of that triangle is 1 half. Base is 1 half times height is 2. Right, to double check that, 7 to 7.5 is the base, the height is 2. Yeah, that looks right. So this is 1 half as an actual area, but to the integral it contributes negatively. We're doing the integral from 5 to 7.5. f of x dx is the integral from 5 to 7, first of all, which will be a quarter circle. Sorry plus the integral from 7 to 7.5. Area of the quarter circle will be half the area of the semicircle, which will be half of this, which is just pi. And again, this area was 1 half, but the graph is below the axis, so it contributes negatively to the integral, so we get pi minus 1 half. Or if you prefer, 
2 pi minus 1 over 2 for the answer for part D. Last part is the integral over the entire interval from 0 to 10. Can we combine some things that we've done already? Integral from 0 to 10 of f of x dx. Let's see, we've got an integral from 0 to 2 and also 2 to 7 and we could also do 7 to 10. So let's write this as a sum of three integrals. Integral from 0 to 2, which we've already figured out, plus the integral from 2 to 7, which we've already figured out, plus the integral from 7 to 10, which we have not fully figured out. You sort of partially figured it out. The integral from 0 to 2 is part A, is 1. The integral from 2 to 7 is part C, that is this. So I'll write, I'll write it like this, negative 1 half plus 2 pi in parentheses. That's a negative sign there. Plus the integral from 7 to 10. This contributes negatively, but we need to figure out the area of this region here. It is a trapezoid, you might say sideways. I could figure out its area with the formula for the area of a trapezoid. It's not the same kind of trapezoid as comes from the previous problems. Um, think of this as the base, which is 2. You multiply the base times the average of the heights. This height, so to speak, sideways, goes from 7.5 to 9, so that's 1.5 there. And this height, so to speak, sideways, is 2.5, right? That's 7, 7.5, yeah, okay, 2.5 there. It's going to contribute, its area is going to be base, which I'm thinking of this as this thing sideways, as 2 times the average of the heights. The average of the heights is 1.5 plus 2.5 divided by 2. 2's will cancel. 1.5 plus 2.5 is 4. The area of that is 4, but it contributes negatively to the integral. Don't forget this part, which also contributes negatively to the integral. The integral is negative 1 half minus 4 which is the same as negative uh, four and a half, negative nine halves. Uh, let's see, so simplify now. I'll bring the two pi out in front. One plus a half is one half, or one plus negative one half is what I meant to say. And then this is gonna be minus nine halves. One half minus nine halves is gonna be negative eight halves or negative four. Looks like the final answer is two pi minus four, about 6.28 minus four would be about 2.8. 2.8. If f of x were representing a velocity, if x were time, the fact that the integral over the entire interval from 0 to 10 is positive, about 2.28 means your displacement, your change in position would be positive, 2.28, and if positive is to the right, you end to the right of where you started. The motion itself would be back and forth to the right when it's positive, then to the left when it's negative, to the right again when it's positive, and this goes positive for a while, so it's going positive for a while. Then it goes negative for a little while too, but not enough to cancel out this one. You do end to the right of where you started about, again, by about 2.28 units. In our final problem, we once again emphasize the geometric meaning of integration as well as talk about limits of Riemann sums as yet another way to compute integrals. In general, that's a harder way to compute integrals, but um, we can do it for linear functions, simple situations like this, or perhaps as long as we've got some extra information like we do in this problem. This summation is the extra information that we need. What is this? This is telling us the sum of the first n numbers turns out to equal n times n plus 1 over 2. You can certainly check that for many examples, and here's an interesting example. If n equals 100, the sum of the first n numbers is 100 times 101 divided by 2 and that turns out to be 5,050. Little story is that Carl Friedrich Gauss figured that out in his head as a, like a kindergartner uh, in like one second. He knew this formula or maybe he derived it quickly in his head. It, it, it's, derivation is pretty interesting as well, but we'll need it for part B. Let's do part A. Evaluate the integral geometrically, evidently as an area under the curve. The curve will be above the axis here. Draw this line, it's going to have a slope of 2 and a y-intercept of 1. We are integrating from 0 to 4, so I want to go out to x equals 4. Slope is going to be 2. 
plug in four into this, you'll get nine. The value at four is nine. We are after the area of this trapezoid rule here, and I could use the trapezoid rule with n equal to one and get the exact answer. Uh, the integral from zero to four of this function is gonna be the base, which is four, times the average of the heights. Average of one and nine will be uh, five. So one plus nine is 10 divided by two is five. Four times five is 20. The exact value of the integral is 20. But now we got to do the hard part, evaluate this integral as the limit of a right-hand Riemann sum. You will need this fact again. Okay, how in the world do we do that? Okay, let's set it up in, the, in a situation that'll work in general, though it may not be always as easy as this one in general. Um, a, the left endpoint is zero. B, the right endpoint is four. Delta x, in the general case is b minus a over n, four minus zero over n here, four over n, and so if I've got a particular value of n, I could use that form to find delta x and get an approximation with a left-hand sum or a right-hand sum, but why would you do that if you've got a trapezoid anyway? But we're doing this just for exercise here. It turns out that a formula for x sub i, the general, uh, well, you could call it the right endpoint of the ith interval, so if if i is one, this is the right endpoint of the first interval. If i is two, it's the right endpoint of the second interval. Its formula is a plus i times delta x. I'll let you figure out why. And that's gonna be helpful here. Zero plus i times four over n simplifies to four i over n. We'll need that. And your general right-hand sum, where you don't specify what n is, is in terms of n, looks like this just like we saw before. And for this problem, what is that gonna become? X sub i is four i over n. I gotta plug in four i over n into the function, and delta x is four over n. Okay, how's this helpful? The integral, by definition, essentially, though it's more subtle than what I'm saying, about to say here, is a limit of right-hand sums. But that begs a question, is it also a limit of left-hand sums? Yes, it is. Is it a limit of trapezoid sums? Yes, it is. Is it a limit of other kinds of sums? And there are other kinds of sums. Midpoint rule is one. Simpson's rule is another, though Simpson's rule is not explicitly uh, the same kind of sum in what we're talking about here. And there are even more general kinds of Riemann sums, and you want all those to converge to the same thing. You want the limit to be the same no matter what. And why should the integral be the limit of this? Say we're in a weirder case where the function is kind of wild. Why should the integral be the limit of such Riemann sums? It's because Intuitively, as you're making the rectangle skinnier and skinnier, you are getting better approximations to the area under the curve. Making n larger and larger is the same as making delta x smaller and smaller, meaning you're making your rectangle skinnier and skinnier. That's why this makes intuitive sense. But now you actually have to calculate it. We need the function f. We need its formula if we're gonna have any hope of finishing this. Carry the limit sign along for the ride. It's a limit as n goes to infinity number of rectangles going to infinity. What is the function f? It's again 2x plus one, so I need to plug in four i over n into that function in place of x, giving me two times four i over n plus one. Gets multiplied by four over n. Looks really scary, don't be too scared. Just keep going. Try distributing the four over n through the parentheses here. And I think I also will at the same time write this summation of something as two sums. That's a property of summations. Summation i goes from one to n. Two times four over n is eight i over n, times another four over n. Eight times four is 32. 32 i over n squared. And then I have the sum i goes from one to n of one times four over n, which is just four over n. Again, just keep going. How in the world can we simplify this? Well, the summation is with respect to i. i is the variable, so to speak, with the summation. If you ignore the limit, 
n is constant. Anything involving a product or dividing by n can be factored out, and also constants like 32 and 4 can be factored out. I can write 32 over n times the summation i goes from 1 to n of i, and there's where I use the given information that this is true here. And then, well, this doesn't depend on i. I'm really adding up a bunch of 4 over n's. How many of them? n of them. 4 over n plus 4 over n plus 4 over n, n times is going to be 4 over n times n. n times 4 over n. And those n's will cancel. This will simplify to 4. Ah, that's pretty nice. And again, this is n times n plus 1 over 2. We're getting somewhere. We can get rid of the summation signs completely now. Limit as n goes to infinity. 32 and the 2 cancel to give 16. Oh, 16 plus 4 is 20. I think we're almost there. 32 divided by 2 is 16. 16, should I multiply this out? You can. Well, let me not at first. 16n times n plus 1 over, uh, I see I made a mistake, should be an n squared, over n squared plus 4, and you don't, this is an n here, you don't have to multiply out the top, but I will. These are not h's, they are n's. Limit as n goes to infinity of 16n squared plus 16n over n squared plus 4, this is a rational function of n, where the numerator and denominator have the same degree of 2. The highest power is both, in both is 2. That limit is the ratio of the coefficients of the highest power. 16 divided by 1 is 16. And 4 is a constant. You get 16 plus 4 is 20. You get the right answer that we already knew geometrically. Can that limit be evaluated more rigorously to confirm it's 16? Yes, you can use L'Hopital's rule if you think of n as a continuous variable, even though we're really thinking of n as discrete. The limit's going to be the same either way. Or you could also do a trick of multiplying the top and the bottom of this by 1 over n squared to help you evaluate the limit using limit properties. But this is fine. This gives you the final right answer of 20. Thanks for watching.